Huh? Amen. That's living, man. I thank God he's good. To... He is. Never miss one. He has never made a mistake. I almost made one one time. <laughs> Close call, man. <laughs> He has never made a mistake. We've all made a mistake, haven't we? Sin comes short of glory of God, not God. Heartache passes. I've seen some people so broken hearted, just look like they couldn't go on. But you know what? Time helps all things. But you know what time won't change? Time will not change heaven, and time will not change hell. Will not. That's what counts in this old life. The most important decision you'll ever make is you must be born again. That's the eternal decision. And once we get get saved, you know what we. Wrought works and wrought reward, rewards, but you must be born again. And it's so easy to focus on uh, things of this old world and pleasures and entertainments and things that really, when it comes down to it, ain't going to amount to a hill of beans till you get that phone call. Take some of the sap out of you, won't it? It's all of us. It's all of us. It's easy to get caught up in things. God knows all about it. He is faithful and he is just. And I thank God for that. Colossians chapter 4 this morning. We're going to finish up the book of Colossians. Somebody said, whoop, whoop. I think it's been a good study. I hope it's been a help. Uh, you know, we kind of came at it with the Laodicea and church period type thing and uh, not necessarily so much talking about the way things are in the church today, but talking about more about what God wants and expects from the church. And it's not that he just wants it, he expects it. And he, he's got a right to have it. You know, we need to examine ourselves from time to time and, and just see how we stand with God. You know, the church today in this period, it's, it's just gotten carnal. You know, you can take this old church building right here and let it sit. And it will never get carnal. One thousand years, this church bill will never get carnal. You know when the church gets carnal? It's when God's people get carnal and bring it into the church. And we're talking about the old past and the old ways, and you just, you just don't see it much nowadays. People rolling with the flow and going downstream instead of fighting upstream and changing and doing things to draw a crowd and churches trying to get the young people in and and they're doing things that's contrary to God's word and it just won't ever work. But we're going to talk, the title of the message this morning is the end of the epistle. That's what we're going to do. We're going to go through the rest of the epistle. Uh, look at verse number 7, Colossians 4 and 7. It says, All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you who's a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who was one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom you receive commandments. If he come unto you, receive him. And Jesus, which is called Justice, who are of the circumcision, these only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. Epaphras, which is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and them in Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nephthys and the church which is in his house. 
And when this epistle was read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea, and say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. The salutation by the hand of me, Paul. Remember my bonds. Grace be with you. Amen. The end of the epistle. Brother Jeff, you pray for us, brother. Paul here is uh, ending this epistle, as he does by others, uh, greeting some people, uh, passing on news, information on different people, encouragement, sometimes chastisement. That's what he does at the end of his letters, his epistles. And uh, now the last thing people hear is what they often remember the most. If you're preaching a sermon, you want to say something that kind of sums up what you preach about. Hung off the chandelier for the last 50 minutes. You want to slow down a little bit and try to say something to kind of sum that thing up and just let the point stick in people's minds. That's just, you know, people say you never get a second chance to make a first impression, and that's true. But you also never get a second chance when you end a conversation. You might have another one, but that one, you'll never end it again. Uh, Hold your place here and turn to Proverbs chapter 12. Proverbs chapter 12. You need to try to say things in such a way that leave a good taste in people's mouths. That doesn't mean your words are smooth as oil because some things are just hard to be said. Even when they need to be said, it's just a hard thing. Nobody likes to scold people. A uh, man pastoring a church, he don't like to have to scold people and take care of issues. But the fact is, that's what God's called a man to do. But there's a way to do it with wisdom. Look at Proverbs 12. Look at verse number 25. Heaviness in the heart of man maketh it stoop, but a good word maketh it glad. The Bible speaks many times about reproving a wise man, he'll be wise. Or prove a fool, and many times he just won't receive it. A good word maketh it glad. Look at Proverbs 15. Turn over there. Proverbs 15, verse number 23. A man hath joy by the answer of his mouth, and a word spoken in due season, how good is it? There's a time and a place and a way to say everything that needs to be said. Uh, I know we're all guilty. I know I am. I suppose you are too of saying some things out of time, out of place. I say some things sometimes that just don't never need to be said. Right. <laughs> There's never a time or a place for it. It just makes my flesh feel good for about two seconds. And then I pay for it for the next six months or six years. You know how it is. It's just how it is. We need to remember the way we say things at a time and place. Turn to Proverbs 25. Proverbs 25. We've all said things to our children that never need to be said. Said things to your wife, said things to your husbands, your co-workers, people at church. You can get by pretty much anything anywhere, but you got to be careful what you say that at church house. Them dudes will pack up. And it ain't got to be the pastor. It can be you from the front view to the back. But you say the wrong thing to a person the wrong way. It's just how it is. It's people, right? We need to be wise about our words. Look at Proverbs 25. Look at verse number 11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. That sounds like a beautiful thing, don't it? An apple of gold and a picture of silver. So here's Paul. Go, go, go back to Colossians 4 with me. Here's Paul. He's ending this epistle like he does others. He says things, and 
Sometimes there's chastisements and scolding it. Scolding many times there's encouragement. There's always grace. Always grace. Grace be unto you and the Lord. He's telling these people, and even when he's having to scold them, because sometimes he's just said some things that's just, man, he has just took them to the woodshed. But it was necessary. But he said it in the spirit of the Lord. He said it with grace. Look back at Colossians 4. Look at verse number 6. We talked about this last week. Let your speech be always with grace. Season, season with salt that ye may know how you ought to answer every man. There's a way that we're to answer every man, every question, everything needs to be said. There's a way that's pleasing to God to say it. And we just need to have wisdom and seek God about, about what we say. Uh, words is like, I've said this before, words are like toothpaste. Anybody can get them out. But ain't nobody going to get it back in. Yeah, right. You can get that tube of toothpaste to saw you, and he will smear it all over this church for you. But the wisest man in the world ain't going to get that toothpaste off that wall back into that tube. We need to be careful what we say. So let's look at Colossians 4. Look at verse number 7. This, I got kind of a hodgepodge of things. I got some... Six or seven things we're going to look at here that's good for us to know. First thing is, look at verse number seven. All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your state and comfort your hearts. Stay informed with the brethren. Stay informed with the brethren. Uh, it's easy to get about our business and get to live in our life. And it'll be all about us, 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 us. And we kind of don't pay much attention to the brethren like we should. Uh, you know, some people oh, are not very bold for requesting help. Not very bold for requesting prayer. But you can see someone and see their countenance. And you can hear by their speech sometimes what they don't say and pick up on things. And, and if you press them and prod them and seek a little bit, they'll be glad to tell you what the problem and the issue is. We all need prayer, right? Some people, that's all they want to do, pray for me. Ain't nothing wrong about that. Pray for me. But some people just aren't like that. Stay informed with the brethren. Hold your place here and... Turn back to Proverbs 25. Let's look at a verse. Not just the brethren here where we are, but we know brethren all over this old world, don't we? Have preachers come through? Have missionaries come through? Proverbs 25. Know people from other churches? Visiting preachers come in sometimes. They bring some of their people with them. We know people all over. Look at Proverbs 25 and verse number 25. As cold water to a thirsty soul, Proverbs 25 and 25, so is good news from a far country. Stay informed with the brethren. Uh, you can look at it from a missionary standpoint. Our missionaries send letters in. It's good to know what's going on. Pray for those folks. I like reading them because I like hearing the good news. Deke's mama got saved. Yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That's a blessing. Uh, I think we live in a time and age in our country where people just ain't beating the altars down to be saved. I'm glad they are in Thailand. Amen. <laughs> Thank God for it. Those missionaries come in and many of them will have an email list. All you have to do is put your email address on there and those letters, you won't have to go get them. They'll come in your email. You can read them. But not just that, people in other churches, people we know all over, all this county, all over uh, Miss Tammy Jones down at Gloryland. She's fighting cancer, just like Miss Jennifer. We know her. Some of y'all know her. Giving prayer requests for Miss Jennifer's got a burden to pray for. You know what? Stay informed with the brethren. Make a point to find out what's going on with people. You know what human nature is? And we had to fight this thing down. Human nature is for a conversation to be one-sided.
It's about me and what I got going on and my ills and my wants and my needs. And we're not careful. That conversation won't be a conversation. It'll be me telling you what Brother James has got going on and, and, and what I need you to pray about for me. And it's not a two-way thing, but a conversation should be a two-way thing, right? Uh, some people like their sermons to be two-way things. People talk back to a preacher. I don't like that. I talk to y'all after the fact. Amen. Once I get going, man, I got my trying and train thought, write it down. We'll talk about it after the fact. But a conversation isn't like that. A conversation is a two-way thing. We need to focus and make it not be one-sided. You know what that is? That's just good old-fashioned human nature. Me and mine. Stay informed with the brethren. Turn back to Colossians 4 with me. Not only that, should we stay informed with the brethren? Look at Colossians 4. Look at verse number 9. The Bible says, With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Now go down to verse number 12. Epaphras who was one of you. So he's a Colossian also, just like Onesimus. They're from, from uh, Colossae. Epaphras, who was one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervor, fervently for you in prayers that you may stand, per, may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and them in Hierapolis. Don't forget the home, folks. Don't forget the home, folks. You know, some of us, we're going to sit right here till the Lord calls us home and praise God. That's a blessing. If that's where God wants you to be, then that's where you need to be in your seat. I ain't going to take your seat. Y'all don't take my seat. That's my seat right there. You know how we have seats. But you know what? Some people go places. And some people do things. And sometimes God moves people. He moves people. He calls people to a place. They grow up. They grow in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. They learn, and then God needs them somewhere else. We got some young people around here that God's called, and they're very talented, and the chances are they might just sit right here rest their lives. There's a good chance, too, God's going to lead them somewhere else. But you know what? When you go somewhere and you have to go, if God moves you, don't forget the home, folks. Uh, God moved us to Montana for a couple of years. You know what? We, you guys prayed for us and called us in Texas and talked to us. We never forgot about Hopewell. Mm -hmm. You know, if God takes you somewhere, man, praise God. Go and go 100% and hand to the plow and do what all you might. I understand all that. But when you go somewhere, if God moves you, don't forget right. where you come from. Right. Easy to forget where you come from, isn't it? Don't forget the home, folks. Turn to, turn to Philemon. That's the last Pauline epistle. Titus and Philemon. Look at verse Philemon, verse number 10. It says, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in times past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me, whom I have sent again, that thou therefore receive him, that is, mine own bow. So here was this man Onesimus. He had ran off from Colossae, from this man Philemon, and he had met Paul in jail, and he got saved. And Paul was sending back, but you know what he was? He was a Colossian. That's what the Bible says. And Paul says he hadn't forgot him. He remembered him. Epaphras, the same way. He was there with Paul, but you know what? He had never forgotten the home folks back at that church, the church of the Colossians. He never forgot him. And the Bible says that he labored and prayed earnestly. He had a zeal for those folks. He wasn't there. He couldn't minister to them. He couldn't help them physically. He couldn't do those things. God had him somewhere else. But you know what he could do? He could pray. And he never forgot to pray. He had a great zeal. Turn back to Colossians chapter 4. Look and see what he prayed about. 
This man, Epaphras, he was one of them. Onesimus was one of them. And they, and they just didn't forget the home, folks. They hadn't forgot. They had gone on to other things, but they hadn't forgot where they had come from. Look at verse number 12. Epaphras, who was one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. He hadn't forgot them. He hadn't forgot the home, folks. See what he's praying for? He may have prayed for their help. Paul said he wished they'd prosper in body and spirit and soul. But it doesn't say that he prayed for the health. It doesn't say he prayed for the financial needs. He may have prayed for that too. I'm not saying he didn't. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's not recorded. What's recorded is that he prayed fervently that they would stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. He prayed for godly stuff. And you know, sometimes what God don't record is just as important as what he does record. You need to read the Bible in its entirety. Hold your place here, Tom, turn to 137, Psalms 137. Psalm 137. Don't forget the home, folks. No matter where your travels take you, where God would have you go, don't forget the home, folks, man. That's why we have homecoming, right? Why? Well, somebody can come home. Look at Psalms 137 and verse number 5. Here was these people, they were in captivity in Babylon. Psalm says, if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. He was asking them to play songs. And this psalm says, if I forget Jerusalem, if I forget God's place, if I forget where God had me at one time, if I forget it, let my right hand forget its cunning and I can't play anymore. Don't forget the home, folks. Turn back to Colossians 4. Colossians 4, not only that, Look at verse number 10 in Colossians 4 with me. You know, we tend to want to congregate and spend time with people that look and act and talk just like us. And I ain't again that. It's comfortable. You know, you go somewhere and you see sometimes, a lot of times it's black folk hanging out with black folk. It's white folk hanging out with black folk with white folk. It's Baptists hanging out with Baptists. It's Methodist. I ain't getting none of that. It's comfortable, right? But the fact is, everybody that loves God and serves God ain't going to look and act and talk exactly like you and I. They're just not. Ain't no 250-pound white men wearing a suit in the Philippines this morning. There probably ain't there one. Too hot. They'd be about to die over there. I've seen that picture of Pastor and Brother Joe standing in front of that big old ship. Big old Brother Joe got an old short sleeve shirt on over there. Why? He can't wear this. You'll die. And they little. And they brown. And they don't have the same speech. There's a lot of people in the Philippines that love God. And they don't look like us and they don't talk like us. But they love God. We need to love them and help them and just serve God with. Look at verse number 10. Astarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and Marcus, sister, son to Barnabas, touching whom you receive commandments. If he come unto you, receive him. And Jesus, which is justice, who are of the circumcision. These men were like Paul's. They were Jews. These believers in Colossae, many of them, I take it to be, were Gentiles. Look what it says. These only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. Paul's saying, look, these people are of the circumcision. You folks are Gentiles, but if they come to you, receive them. If you paid attention to your Bible reading, and I know you have in the preaching, these Jews give these Gentile believers a flat-out fit. It's what the book of Galatians is about. Just give them a flat-out, flat-footed fit. 
because in their eyes they were still dogs. But these men had gotten saved by the grace of God and they go into a church full of Gentiles, they're outsiders. But Paul said, receive them. And I believe this, and it kind of goes along with what the pastor said, one of the things he said Sunday night. You can walk as far with someone as the word of God allows. This book will let you know how far you can walk with someone. They may not act like you, may not look like you, may not talk like you, but of what they're doing, if they believe this book and what they're doing is not against this book, you can walk with them just as far until somebody strays from what this book says do. I don't care what their skin color is. I don't even care what their denomination is. They may not have one. They few and far between. There's, but there's some people that love God. They don't look like us and act like us and talk like us. You know what that is? That's a missionary principle. If you go to at Brother Caden Heads, but he, he's in Africa, I guess. He left, he left yesterday, didn't he? Probably ain't very many people look like him over there. He's going to round up a church full of people who look like him. He's going to have a small church, man. They don't think like him. They don't talk like him. He's going to preach that book. And these people are going to get saved. And they're going to learn to love God and learn to serve God. And they ain't going to look like him and probably ain't going to dress like him. But the fact is, they love God. And what they do, don't go and get this book. You know what he's going to do? He's going to walk with them. He's going to help them and lead them and guide them. It don't mean anything goes. You preach something like that and people want to put every, every principle and conviction they have aside. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about if somebody lives and acts and talks that lines up with this book, it's all right if they don't wear a suit like Brother James. It's just all right. Look at verse number 14 with me. Verse number 14. It's only one verse. But man, there's so much in this verse. The Bible says in Colossians 4 and 14, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. You know there's different ways that you can finish your race. Now, if you're born again by the grace of God, the finish line is the finish line, man. But how you run your race that's going to make a big deal when you stand before Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. And here we have what Paul calls Luke, the beloved physician. And he mentions old Demas. He don't say much about Demas. He just says, and Demas greets you. So here is Demas with Paul, and here is Luke with Paul. Both of them with a the man of God, right? Hold your place here and turn to 2 Timothy. Second Timothy, the last epistle that most people believe Paul wrote before they chopped his head off. He went home to glory. This is it. This is his swan song. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 11. First, look there. It says, only Luke is with me. That old Luke, that dude was faithful, wasn't he? Yeah. Through the ups and the downs and the hardships and the trials, they didn't deter this man. There wasn't a lot of glory in what the man was doing. Uh, it's hard to get a lot of glory spending all your time with a man like Paul. <laughs> that dude beat down half the time. In prison, the world hated that man. Uh, religious people hated him, and secular people hated him, and the government hated him. Mr. He, he was a godly man. He was God's man, and this world hated him. And wherever he went, there was old Luke, his doctor, walking around with him. Not much glory in that. But then you got Demas. Look at verse number 10. 2 Timothy 4 and 10. Now, Demas was with Paul, right? But look what he says here, Paul, at the end of his life. 
He said, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed into Thessalonica. Demas forsook Paul for that world. When it got tough and it got hard and the going got tough, Demas got going. He pulled out on him. He left him. When he figured out, got to a certain point where there's not any more glory in this, you know what that dude did? That dude hit the world. The world got its hooks into him and it drug him out of God's service. The love of God, it drug him away from God's man Paul that needed his help, that wanted his help, desired his help. And, and I can't help but think, it says he departed into Thessalonica. Now, he was, he was a saved man, I took it to be. But he was a carnal man. He loved this world. And that Bible-believing man that loved God and served God, he had had enough of that, and he went out in this old world. I don't know this, but they kind of ain't no doubt in my mind. That dude went up in a church somewhere. I just believe that. He went up in a church somewhere. And you see it. People get carnal and get worldly. And they're tired of standards. And they're tired of them people down there telling me what to do. And they're tired of I can't have this and I can't have that. So the Lord sends them somewhere else. We've seen that, right? If you've been saved any length of time, you've seen it. it. may not have been here, but you've seen it somewhere. The Lord sends them somewhere else to do some work. And they go out a little bit and dabble here and dabble there, but for very long they're going to settle down to exactly what they want to do. And many times it's carnal and it's worldly, and many times it involves a carnal, worldly church. It's what it does. And where they have liberty to live carnally, and after this old flesh and love and partake in the things of this world and people won't look down their nose at me and there's nothing in the world but they can run and try to hide from this book, this word. It's what it is. It's all it is. And they may look the same. They may sing the same music. But you know what? If you put out all the standards this book says and become carnal and worldly, you ain't nothing but another Southern Baptist church. I don't care what you got on the sign. And there we go beating them down. I ain't beating them down either. They just are what they are. They're carnal, the worldly, and they're fleshly. Well, how do you know? I was a member of one for about five years. Yeah, they more carnal and worldly and fleshly than I am. God help them. I got a problem. Y'all may not, but I got a problem. My flesh loves the things of this world. Uh, you know, it's sad to say, but in this church period we live in, more people know what LeBron James says than what King James says. And we look at ourselves around here and you think, brother, it ain't like that. Brother, they's few and far between like right here. That's an absolute true statement in this world and this country we live in today. So you can finish your race however you want to. Turn to 1 John chapter 2. Let's look at a verse and we're going to move on. 1 John chapter number 2. You know what this world will do? This world will dry you out. It'll make you cold and dead as a saltfish. First John chapter two. We used to buy them things and fish with them. Them old herrings in that plastic pack. They caught them old herrings at the ocean somewhere and jammed them dudes and some salt and pickled them. 
and put them dudes in that plastic pack and we would buy that thing and cut it and put it on a hook and drop it in water and that thing would leave an oil slick. Look like, <laughs> look like you pour some motor oil on. People eat them things, man. You know what that is? That is dead and cold. That's what this whole world will do to you. Look at 1 John 2, verse number 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You know, this man Demas, he was saved. He wasn't lost. When he began to love this world and forsook Paul and walked off from Paul, he wasn't lost. He had just lost his love for God. And folks, that can happen to any of us. We get loving this old world and dabbling in this world. You know, that scripture is still in there. The things that are highly esteemed among men are abomination with God. We can look at the things we love and the things that please us, and if this world loves them, you better be careful because if that thing gets in your heart, it'll be me and you that's on the outside next. That won't ever happen to me. I bet you Demas probably said that sometime. Turn back to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. So here we have Paul writing this epistle. Look at verse number 15. The Bible says, Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nephthys and the church which is in his house. And when this epistle was read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. And we're talking about this, this epistle being tied in with the Laodicean church age. And you know what Paul had? Paul had love for struggling brethren. He just did. Many times he'd write and encourage them and uh, think, about, think about that 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 Corinthian church. Man, them dudes was carnal. They had things going on. And Paul would write him and scold him. Then he would encourage him in the Lord. You know what he had? He had a heart for that church, for that brother. Not every church is humming along like ours is. We have problems, no doubt. You get people together, you're going to have issues and problems. But you go places and you see places and you see other churches and they're trying to be faithful and struggling on and just trying to go on for God. And man, they are flat out struggling. We should remember those churches. We went down to Glory Land Baptist Church a while back in Birmingham. They ain't got a pastor. You know what they are? They're struggling, man. They still got people coming, but you know what? If you don't have a head, somebody lead the church, you're struggling. You see these churches around here, and some of these men are getting older, and they're getting up in years, and the churches are struggling. Paul had a love for the brethren in churches that are struggling. And you and I should too. Look at verse number 17. And say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. Paul told this fellow, he said, you got a ministry received of the Lord. He said, be sure you fulfill it. You and I should fulfill the ministry given us even in these last days. Uh, things look bad, things look dark, and you see people throwing in the towel and quitting and quitting on God and quitting on church. And you know what? When God releases you from something, it's fulfilled. Until God releases you from something, it's not fulfilled. You see, people need to do different things and go different places. Sometimes God's in that thing. God needs his people and he needs you here and there. He'll release someone. But you know what? Many times someone laying down the towel and throwing in the towel, it's nothing to worry about. They're leaving a ministry unfulfilled. Shouldn't be like that. Look at verse number 18, last one. Paul said, The salutation by the hand of me, Paul, remember my bonds. Grace be with you. Amen. He asked folks to remember his bonds. Paul didn't say a lot, things like that. That's just a short sentence, but he did ask them to remember him. And you and I should remember those that are facing persecution today. Uh, 
Stopped by and got some gas this week. There was a dude there filling his car up. I, had a, I put a truck up on that gas station thing. I know they're tired of throwing them things away. I put it up there. That dude was over there filling up his truck. He was leaning up on his truck. That dude was eating something. I thought, I'm going to give this dude a track. So I walked over there. I said, hey, man, how you doing? He said, I'm all right. I said, let me give you a track, man, a gospel track. Tell you how to be saved. If, if you don't have a home church or address on the back, you're welcome to come visit. He looked at it. He said, no, thank you. I said, you sure? He said, no, thank you. I took it back. That man persecuted me. That's about all the persecution we're going to face. That's about the extent of our persecution in North and South Carolina in 2022. You know what? That ain't much, is it? There's people over there, all over this old world in China. You get up with this book, you are going to wake up in jail, man. They're going to hit you on top of your head, and you're going to wake up in the jailhouse. Remember those that are facing persecution? China, Russia, missionary Christians over there that are facing persecution. Ukraine, Africa. There's a lot of countries in Africa that are open to the gospel. There's a lot of them that are Muslim. Muslim countries. You will wake up dead over there, man. Middle East, can you imagine being a missionary? I'm going to Iraq to be a missionary. No, you ain't. Nobody else is either. There's some people over there, though, with the word of God trying to win people to the Lord Jesus Christ. We should remember those that are facing persecution. I got one for you. Canada. Oh, Canada. Canada? There's a man in jail right now, pastors of Baptist Church in Canada. And they shut him down for the COVID, couldn't have service, and the man had service, and they arrested him, keep him locked, kept him locked up two or three weeks. They let him back at jail. They had another service. They locked that dude up again. As far as I know, he's still in jail. In Canada? For what? For having outside out, not inside, outside church services. That man's locked up. You know what that is? That's persecution. Ain't nobody going to come lock us up. It just ain't going to happen. Not right now. It might one day. But as of right now, we could have church every night we want to. Except that night our favorite television program's on. We can't have it that night. But other than that, we could have church every night if we wanted to. Set when the game's on. We can't have it that night. <laughs> can't have it that night. There are those facing persecution. And just like Paul asked for his friends and people to remember his bonds, we should remember those people that are facing persecution. I got a conclusion here. And uh, this church, this epistle, had an end time slant to it. The word Laodicea mentioned five times. You know the book of Revelation. That's the last church age before the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. And, you know, we all know this book. There's no order to it. It's just kind of jammed. Everything random. Nothing goes together. You know, you know we know. I mean, that's what the world will tell you, right? Change what you want because it's just the words of man anyway. But we know God has ordered this book. He's ordered in such a way that we can read it and study it and never get to the bottom of it. Amen. It's a living word. So this epistle was written to that last church period before the rapture of the church. And the very next book you have is the book of First Thessalonians. So you go from that end time church age to, look with me, and we just went through these things recently with the pastor. He preached a series on it. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse number 10. Everybody see that? It says, And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. We know what that is? It's the rapture, man. Last church age, the next thing is the rapture. Look at chapter 2, verse number 19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? You know what that is? It's the rapture. Amen. Last church period in the rapture, right? Look at chapter 3. Look at verse number 13. 
The Bible says to the end he may establish your hearts unblameable and holiness before God, even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Look at chapter number 4. We know it, verses 13 through 18. It's the rapture of the church, right? Book of Colossians, the last church period. The next thing is the rapture. Look at chapter 5, verse number 9. The Bible says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as ye do. It's dark times, man. It's bad times. The church has gone to pot. It's so worldly that you can't tell the church and the world apart. Let me encourage you, the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back soon, but until he chooses to come, yeah. you and I need to remain faithful and love God and love people and love man's souls until the end, whatever that may be, whether it's our death or the rapture, whichever comes first. Thank you, Lord. Brother Terry Brooks, you pray for us, brother.